Welcome back. We've been monkeying around for five minutes. Barry, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it now, man. Okay, module six. Module six, we're going to start talking about MVVM frameworks. Specifically, we're going to be talking about PRISM. All right. Sounds like a plan. Uh, let's kind of go through what we will talk about. We'll talk, I'll talk, um, I guess, at a high level about MVVM. But again, this isn't a class about MVVM. Yep. This is really talking about the framework, the implementation, and go on from there. All right, that being said, let's talk about MVVM. Okay. <laughs> let's drive this one home, if we don't mind. We are not teaching you MVVM. Hopefully, you already know it. If you don't already know it, there are tons of resources out there trying to teach you MVVM. Some of them are great. <laughs> That's true. All right. Uh, here's something interesting. No, nobody likes a dense slide, so we have to have one obligatory dense slide. And let me tell you what it says. MVVM was born with XAML. Basically, the WPF team, um, they are the same team that, that uh, birthed XAML as a uh, variant of MVC. And then uh, you can kind of see its relationship with XAML when you look at all of the, imp the uh, interfaces and the binding pieces and all the things yeah. around XAML and how it complements MVVM. It was an evolution of a pattern that had already been established and is effectively facilitated by the data binding syntax that mm -hmm. XAML exposes. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right. But not what is, not what is MVVM. What is Prism MVVM for store apps? Prism is not Prism for WPF. I have to start with that one because often I'll talk to developers and they'll say, what framework do you use? And I say I use Prism, and they all go the same way. They're like, whoa, that is a big framework. I'm like, no, 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 you have that totally wrong. In, that's Prism for WPF, and it builds this composable model of smart clients, and it is pretty heavy, to be honest. This is the same name, but a totally different framework. It's super lightweight and extremely pluggable and flexible that for the development that you're doing. And that's what we're going to talk about. It was built by the... Microsoft Patterns and Practices team. I used capital P's there. You did. Uh, Microsoft Patterns and Practices team. They put that. They put all of it together. They put all of the the enterprise library that we used for years and years, mm -hmm. and as well as the Prism for WPF and Prism MVVM and Prism MVVM for store apps in Universal Apps, which we can get on NuGet, right? Absolutely. It was specifically built. So this is different than let's say. MVVM Lite, which is an excellent MVVM framework as well, right? It is. This it is, is really not a judgment of others at all. We're just talking about this one and partly why it's good, a good choice, a very good choice. Um, MVVM, our uh, Prism MVVM was built specifically for Windows Store apps. That is unlike any other platform out there. It handles a lot of things for you, including um, things like managing state and navigation through the page elements and things that are really specific to just the store app. So why would you pick one over the other? Maybe, and this is really what drove us, you would pick one that was built for this platform specifically. And so um, it's also universal across the different platforms uh, as well, so it works really great. Um, so here's a big URL for you. It's a short URL, coincidentally. <laughs> it's aka.ms slash prism dash MVVM. This will get you started at the main page that will drive you to all the other resources. What are those other resources? There's a quick note that we should make there, though, is that documentation is specific to uh, the 8.1 version of Prism, which targets the Windows runtime only. Mm -hmm. The uh, version that we're using is the one for uh, universal apps, and there's been some modifications there. For example, the, uh, the one that targeted Windows 8.1 used da data annotations for validation. Because that is not available on the Windows Phone platform today, That's right. uh, those aspects are cut out, which is why we implemented our own solution that we talked about in the uh, previous module. Yep. Even then, their, their uh, validation was insufficient. <laughs> I, just, I just think of it. I mean, not, it wasn't them, right? It just wasn't as, as broad as what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, that's right. Having said that, that documentation is incredible. It is a, a wealth of information for you. It is extremely thorough going through design choices and coding choices and on and on through it without even getting into PRISM. Yes. And so then you also move into Prism MVVM, and it talks about MVVM, and it talks about the implementation. And the, a couple of the 
Um, method signature names changed. Um, not too many things are really different, but it wasn't updated yet for, uh, for universal apps. Yeah, I think the great thing about that documentation is it provides a lot of architectural guidance. Mm -hmm. You know, it really explains the problem domain that Prism is aiming to solve, which is to a certain extent what we've been articulating throughout today and through tomorrow, is Universal Apps has a specific set of problem domains that you know, a good deal of thought and a lot of the implementation patterns that we discuss will enable you to solve. Yep. All right, so Prism simplifies the boilerplate code, right? This is the stuff we do over and over again. All right, now how do I save state? All right, now how do I restore my navigation state? All right, now how do I deal with application launch? All right, all of these things get nicely rolled in together. So that's one of the biggest values. So we still get many of the things we're accustomed to in MVVM frameworks anyway, um, you know, around um, models, view models, attaching them and being able to navigate. We get all of that for sure, but we also get this extra stuff that just makes it easier to build a store app. And so uh, it certainly has made it easier for us in a lot of different aspects. All right, th these are some of the resources for uh, Prism. So first of all, all of the source code is on CodePlex. So uh, maybe you aren't the kind of guy who likes to load this from NuGet, maybe instead you want to, you know, actually bring these in as projects and reference them that way. Then you can monkey, monkey with. There's monkeys every. Don't do it, <laughs> and, uh, but nonetheless, you could bring in the source code. You could review it. There's a lot to learn there, to be honest. And you can do some extensions. And you could extend it to meet whatever the specific need you are. If there's any problem like that, that's right. But if you are the NuGet guy, there's also Prism on NuGet. You can install it easy enough. Um, so there, there's the way to install it in, on, in the command line, but it's a lot easier just to right click uh, your solution or your uh, project references and add it straight from NuGet. Really great and uh, works like a charm. You can also get uh, a whole slew of samples uh, from MSDN. You can also get a whole slew of samples from you and me now. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Solarizer, it's a pretty in-depth implementation of the Prism framework for sure. And finally, uh, here are all the docs, that one that we were talking about, the, the book basically, um, is really, really deep and rich and really good for you if you wanted to uh, just look over some guidance. You can get that on MSDN, just search for Prism for Windows Runtime and you can download the book from there. It's pretty great. Um, the documentation itself, that document really is, perhaps as aside from us, <laughs> the most comprehensive guidance available. You know, it seems like it's easy to find samples, lots and lots of samples, but it's sometimes it's the right thing to, for somebody just to stink and say, do it this way unless you've got another reason, right? Yep. And so I think that's one of the best parts about it. It says, do it this way unless you've got a reason not to. It's really, really good. All right, so now that's, that's the idea of Prism. Let's go to basic Prism implementation so we get a feel for what it's going to take. Uh, the first thing that we think about is the app.xamlcs. So app.xamlcs is what runs initially in any XAML application. It is long and hairy. It is a messy boilerplate clunk of code that comes out. I mean, it really is. And uh, it's, the e it's an easy thing for you to go in and really mess up. It's, it's easy to get wrong. There's a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of moving parts, things that aren't super explained, and so things that are, they almost feel like they're just, you don't even know why they're there. Yeah, it seems like it's unnecessary to expose it. It does to me. So the Prism framework encapsulates it all for you. It puts it into a base class called MVVM app base, and uh, you can change it so that your app no longer inherits from application, but instead it inherits from MVVM app base, and all that boilerplate code is rolled up, and it's even kind of fixed a little bit. There's a couple extra capabilities that you get, including advanced state management that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, there really is only one um, um, method that you have to override. In this sample on the screen, yeah, there are two methods that we override, the on initialize and the on launch. The on initialize is pretty much a guarantee. You're gonna get the on initialize so you can do all kinds of upfront stuff that you wanna make sure is done inside your application before it launches or activates. Launch, on the other hand, is 
always running, is always executed on launch, right? There's a lot of ways to launch an application. One of them is to use your primary tile, but there are other ways too, right? A toast notification or a secondary tile. Or protocol um, activation. Or protocol activation. There's a lot of different ways to do it, and it really depends on the current state of your app. And when that happens, that w something you need to happen at launch. So let's say it's load initial data. Let's say it's run authentication and things like that. It can all be done right there inside launch application async. And different than the one that you see, um, different than the, the one that you see in the base implementation that comes out of the box, is this is all asynchronous and it can all run un underneath an extended start screen and it just really gives you a lot of great functionality and we'll talk about it. Just flick back quickly, uh, one thing that's probably worth calling out is the bottom line there where you uh, generate a, a null task basically. Yeah. And you do that just to satisfy the need because this is effectively an async operation that requires a task to be returned back, if you're not going to put a body in there, you've still got to return back a task value. On the, uh, the one above, where you are actually doing, returning the base override, that satisfied that requirement. So you may not have noticed that trick beforehand. I just want to call your attention that to That task out from result null. Yeah. yeah. So that'll, ha that'll handle it. Another way we could do it, we could have awaited a delay zero. Mm -hmm. That seems ridiculous, yeah. though. Well, it's all kind of uh, it is a, little, a little bit silly. A little weird looking, yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. Okay, this is the startup process from Solarizer. All the things that we think about when we start up. And I, the, one of the reasons I show this is because I want you because to see... Because we will be asking questions on this later. That's right. If you want to get points for this class, you better have this memorized. <laughs> yeah. And moving Three, on. Three, two, yeah. <laughs> Um, the first is just to appreciate that this is very complicated, right? Getting Solarizer to start, making sure the data is ready, making sure that we've cleared the cache, making sure that we've authenticated properly, on and on, all the different things that we do. This sort of lays it all out. You don't need to really follow the whole thing, just appreciate its complexity, but also appreciate that we've implemented this inside of Prism. You might think, wow, I've got a really complex uh, project, I don't know for sure if Prism is going to be able to, it's extremely flexible and extremely um, uh, capable as well. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you just look at this, it goes from right to left and right to left and right to left in three, three rows. And um, basically everything that's happening in app.xamlcs is in that dark blue. And then you can see that in the first row, we, in, we begin the showing of the splash screen. We continue with the app so XAML. The big point there is that is the... Uh, extended splash screen, obviously your regular application splash screen, the static image, is being displayed by the infrastructure when you launch your app. That's right. And so this allows a seamless transition from that static image into this interactive image. I appreciate that you said that. That's exactly right, because it goes from something that's boring to look at to something that doesn't look like your app is frozen. Yeah. That's right. Uh, then it uh, continues in the processing, and it finally ends up in that green section where that is the, we're prompting them to log in. And so that's the combination of the view and view models um, running. And then that actually comes back after they've logged in. And uh, we continue the process until we get to that red section in the bottom row where uh, we invoke the, um, the main page view model. So that's the main page view model. It's, uh, there's a lot to it. I, there, mm -hmm. No reason to step through all the pieces. Just know that it's there. We've thought this through. And clearly, Patterns and Practices has thought through uh, Prism as well. All right, the startup process for launch, activate and restore are different. What we just showed you was launch, and launch is the most typical um, way to begin your application. Certainly the first way. Certainly the first way you would ever do it, <laughs> uh, but you can also activate it. That's, the, that's when your application is brought back into focus, even though it's already launched, but maybe it's a, a secondary uh, page behind. Um, or maybe the user goes into, or, or they could even click a... Um, um, they could even click a URI that uses a custom protocol activation that activates your app. It doesn't launch it because it's already launched. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the, uh, the ability to restore from suspend. That happens all the time. You've got to handle all of those. We were certainly just showing, showing one of them. This is the basic implementation of Prism. If you get these five things, then you pretty much get everything that you need as far as the base part of Prism in, inside your application. The first is what we've already talked about, that MVVM base replaces the base class in, uh, or the application base class in AppXamlCS. Uh, the next thing is all of your views, this is all of your page, this, all of your pages basically, or all of your XAML, right? It impl they, those implement iView. And the reason we do that is because when navigation comes along, that they, it knows what to look for, but just know, 
all of your views should implement iView. The nice thing about this implementation, it has no methods, no properties, and no events. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require you to change It's just code. a marker interface, basically. It, it really is just a marker interface, that's right. Every view model inherits from view model. That's another important one. This is great because it gives you the effectively bindable base as well as some other features as well. And that's really great. Mm -hmm. uh, just know that you get that. Again, it doesn't have any sort of abstracts that you must implement. It has several virtuals, like on navigated to and on navigated from, what we'll talk about in a little bit. But th those are the first things. You have your views and view models. Just make sure your views implement iView and your uh, view models inherit view model. Uh, then finally, inside your views, and this is, um, this is really nice. Inside your views, this is in the XAML itself, you're going to implement a, or you're going to set an attached property mm -hmm. called viewmodellocator.autowireViewmodel. This basically means at runtime, when it brings up your view, it'll also go get the associated view model and then make them together, right? Join them at the hip sort of thing. Which will work if you've got dependency injection enabled. Which works especially if you have dependency injection. You want it especially if you have dependency injection. And we'll talk about dependency injection here in just a minute. And so the final thing, and really those four are the base. Uh, the fifth one is sort of candy, to be honest. And it's using that D operator. So D colon uh, page.datacontext allows me to set a, um, a view model specific to the design time data. Yeah, so for those of you who weren't watching previous sessions, D colon is an XML namespace declared in XAML that maps to the design time support for XAML. Because your design time view model will also inherit the same interface, I hope, as the view model you use at runtime, it also means that you'll get um, strongly typed IntelliSense as you are building out your XAML. Because you, nothing is worse than typing binding space and not getting anything. You want to say binding space and get first name, last name, or whatever's in your model. Yes, indeed. All right, let's just uh, kind of step through this and look at how it might look like in code. Um, I, inside our application, we could create a base page that everything will inherit from. This might be really important for your application because of the way that you do authentication, right? You might want to make sure that every page, when it's loaded, double checks that the user is logged in. Or you might, to be more concrete, you might have an experience which allows people that don't, haven't created an account to leverage your app. If you've got this out in the app store and it's a consumer-oriented app, you don't want the first thing somebody sees is log in or die. You, know, you don't want to have that. So you might want to have a, a tempered experience which allows people to preview what the application is going to look like without being logged in. Then um, you could implement a login and say, hey, register and we'll uh, release some premium content for you. Yeah. Those same views could then show that premium content by detecting the login state. That's right. So that, you would do that maybe with a property in your base page that says, show a little, show everything. Mm -hmm. right? And you kind of base your view based on that. Anyway, this is the page base that you would inherit everything from. As you cre create uh, views or pages, um, you just make sure that they inherit this page base that you have in your project. The second thing is the view itself. So here's my main page, just as an example. You can see that it inherits from, it usually inherits from page. I've made it inherit from controls.pagebase. From this point forward, I have universal control of my pages throughout my entire application. Right? Otherwise, there's no change at all. Then we have um, the interface. Remember, we're going to build our view models off of an interface, hopefully, that allows us to create design time and runtime view models that have the same signatures. And so uh, this is simple, right? It's just an I main page view model has a title. Not that big of a deal. But then we can look at the runtime view model. That's in the view models namespace. And in there, we, ha we do a couple things. One, we inherit, no, we implement. Yes, we inherit from view model. And so view model comes from Prism. Remember, that gives us bindable base and a couple other features as well. Not too much, but just enough to make it really neat for us. And uh, then in addition, comma, we also implement I main page view model. This means that our main page that we have here for runtime implements all the properties that are defined in our interface. Really important, really nice, because then when we get to the design time main page view model, it also inherits, it also implements the I main page view model has the same signature. But look, it doesn't inherit view model. We don't need a whole bunch of functionality at design time because really nothing runs at design time anyway. So all we need is the basic signature so that we can stick stuff in at binding so we can see it in the designer and that's it. And so we don't need a whole bunch of functionality. We absolutely do not need to implement or to inherit from view model. Make sense to you? 
Perfect sense. All right. So here it is all laid out. This would be the starting place of just the simplest app, right? Just a main page. It shows the title. They don't have to, be, yes. You could charge a fortune for this. They do not have to, it doesn't have to be a gigantic set of classes or anything. It just starts to build everything out in the right structure for you. Let's look at this on how it's actually implemented inside the XAML. So the first thing that you do is you change the, change your XAML's page tag, right? Remember, so uh, as soon as I create a, a page, it inherits from page is what you would expect. We're not gonna inherit from page. We're inheriting from our new base class. So just remember, you're gonna do that in the code behind, but you're also gonna do that in your XAML as well. See where it says controls colon page base? That's because that's where your page base exists inside your uh, controls namespace. So don't forget to change them both. Sometimes you change one and not the other. That's a source of problems, no doubt about it. Uh, all right, and so the next thing is this auto wire view model. Really nice feature. It allows, it basically, our way of saying to the navigation service, uh, whenever you navigate to this page, go find the view model that belongs to it and then bring it in and set it as the data context. Really great. Um, I don't know why you'd ever set that to false. Can't think of one. The I only reason would be if you're uh, using a view that didn't have a view model. Yeah, it'd be weird. I'd just not put it at all. That's mm -hmm. fine. I, it, you, yeah. it just needs it to invoke it. All right. The next is handling design time. So in this case, I'm going to create a namespace for design time, and I'm going to reference it out to the design time um, uh, namespace in my code. And then I can say d colon page data context. That d colon is important because what it basically means is um, at runtime, throw this away. And so d colon is only for design time. And so here I'm setting the data context at design time to my design time view model. Perfect. Now I get to see a whole bunch of stuff. Is everything all right? Where's the namespace for D? Yeah, I realize it's not there. I, I, must, have, uh, I must have cut it by mistake. Yeah, enhance There's, the size. Yeah, I, I enhanced the slide, right? <laughs> and uh, we'll go into the full thing of it, right? And so if you look at this, this really is the base implementation, right? What's a, uh, what's a view look like for when you're using Prism? Uh, something like this, right? Do you have to have design time data? No. Do you have to auto wire up your view model? No, you don't, right? There's a lot. Do you have to inherit from the ba base class? You should. Do you have to close your controls page base tag? Yeah. You should have. This is pseudocode in a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The reality is, look, it's a very, very few things that you need. Several key concepts in Prism solve tons of, solve a ton of, not tons of, solve a ton of developer problems. And wait till you see what it actually does. We'll go through each of mm -hmm. them, and it's just feature after feature and solving problem after problem. Let's begin with the navigation service. So the navigation service is something you get out of the box with Prism. You get a navigation service with the frame object already in the framework, but it has some limitations and certainly doesn't do all the discovery and extra stuff that this navigation service does for us. And it's all very testable. One of the key concepts around Prism is that all of the pieces, um, many of them, can be replaced and make them pluggable. It is composable. But because of that, it also means they're very testable. I have a session state, and I really need to test that session state. It's a little challenging the way session state is implemented inside um, the base framework, but it, with, with Prism, everything is very testable. All right, let's talk about the navigation service, though. This service, does it, it does an incredible job. It finds both the view and the view model without you telling them where they are. And uh, the way that it does that is by the experience. And so what's an experience? It's just a string. That's all that it is. So for example, let's say it's for main page. So we know we have a main page. That's our view. We know we have a main page view model. That's our view model, right? What's the experience name? Main. And so that means that if the view model needs to navigate to another view model or navigate to a view, right? It, it doesn't have to have a type reference. It yep. doesn't even have to know its name. It's about loose coupling. It just decouples everything for you. That's yeah. exactly right. And as you say, it aggregates together the concept of the main experience into implementation that is obscured from you. That's right. Uh, the experience login would go to the view login page and the view model login page view model. Mm -hmm. And that's just a continuing convention that keeps things rolling. And that's the way you do things right out of the box. Does that drive you crazy? Do you absolutely have to have the letter X in the middle or something like that? No problem. Developers can override all of this behavior to make it do exactly what they want to. This is just how it operates right out of the box. Absolutely. It's one of those things in which you can embrace the uh, conventions and work in a very low friction way. 
mm -hmm. or you can rail against them, create your own implementations, and then you have to follow the rules that you set. Uh, it's kind of a configuration by convention is a strategy that's been employed by a lot of frameworks. Obviously, MVC is one of the uh, premier ones in the Microsoft stack, but yep. it exists in many other of the open source frameworks and so on that are out there. And it's become very, very popular because it saves you from having to do a bunch of configuration and setup work. You just follow the initial rules, put them where it expects to find them, and it'll just work. It sense. also means a project that you create and a project that I create are going to have similarities that I'll just fall into. Yes. And sometimes those conventions are worth it. Perhaps this is, I mean, that definitely is nice to be able to navigate and, not, and just use a string, right? Um, perhaps the biggest value of the navigation service inside Prism and VVM is that the navigated to and the navigated from are both invoked or received on the view. Like we already know, every page you can override on navigated to and on navigated from. But every view model also has an on navigated to and an on navigated from. The on navigated to has the same exact navigation payload that you pass to the page. Mm -hmm. That means if you are navigating somewhere and you pass that navigation payload, the page can interact with it if they need to. Sometimes they just ignore it. The view model receives it as well and does it. So I'm going to a details page, let's say, and the details, I need to pass an integer that represents the appointment ID, let's say, and uh, I can easily do that just by navigating to it and trusting that the view model will receive that payload the same. Yeah, it's, it's worth just doing a quick point out right now that um, it's a lot of passionate debate around the code behind versus view model. And you might hear some people that argue if you're embracing MVVM, then you should have zero code in your code behind and so on and so forth. The reality is your code behind is code that relates to your view. So if there are specific things that you need to do that relate to the view data, why not do it within the context of the view itself? Yep. So you'd still want to have the navigated to and navigated from being called in that code behind so you can trigger and attach to anything that you need to attach that is specific to view. Equally, to Jerry's point, the power of having those same events raised directly into your uh, view model means you don't have to manually get hold of your data context, data context and pass on your navigated to from your code behinds into your view model, which is what people were doing originally. Yeah. You would get it only in the page, so naturally you have to hand it off. And now all of yeah. a sudden you have a coupling that you did. That's what a lot of people actually used to do in uh, their base pages. They would create a base page implementation. They would have a base uh, view model. They would cast the data context if it wasn't null to uh, that interface. Then they would hook in the navigated to, navigate from, and call it through. Right. And uh, in all reality, that's not wrong. Um, it, not at all. Prism basically does all that for you. Right? It's not exactly. doing something totally different. Yeah. It's just wiring it up so you don't have to do it again and again. So you can it's that boilerplate code. code that you don't have to fiddle with. Yep. yep, that's exactly right. All right, passing navigation payloads is one of the most common developer challenges, and it's solved by Prism. Really important and really value, probably one of, if not the most valuable pieces of the navigation uh, service inside Prism. All right, every view model has navigation overrides. This is just kind of what it looks like. So here's on navigated to. This is where I would use object P. You know, it doesn't know the type. It's not strongly typed. You're still going to have to cast it. And remember, you're probably, when you do pass uh, navigation payloads, it's going to be a string. Just remember, always pass a string. You might be tempted to pass an object, right? This is one of the reasons it frustrates me when I look at the templates that come in Visual Studio. One of the navigation parameters is actually a record. And that's, it, it, when you look at how, you serialize the navigation state when you go into suspension. That just doesn't work properly. All right, anyway, and MSDN agrees with me, and I don't understand all these things, why they're like that, but they are. Okay, then we also have navigated from. This is our opportunity to save state if it's suspending, so it includes a Boolean, whether or not it's suspending, and that's why you get navigated from, which is cool. I can count on on navigated from that way, so I can unwire events if I need to, you know, and release that dependency on some other object, or I can just save the state out. Pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's an example of how we called and used navigation um, specifically inside Solarizer. So those first three lines up there are us calling out and navigating to, um, in this case, the appointment detail. And so we uh, don't pass a string when we do it. Uh, we actually pass an enumerable, but that's just because we don't like literal strings. But you, could, you don't have to do it this way. And then we create the payload. And the payload, we're um, bringing it down so it's just a string. That's all that we want to pass. And in this case, we're just passing the ID. 
And so you see navigation service, that's the Prism Navigation Service dot navigate. It feels almost, well, it is uh, yeah. identical to the navigation service we identical use today. Signature. Pass in the destination, pass in the payload. This, the, what is different is you don't pass a type to it, right? Because then you have to have a reference to that type in order for it to work. So this solves a lot of the kind of decoupling issues around MVVM that uh, are frustrating around the existing uh, navigation uh, framework. And then look at the bottom block here. This is the on navigated to um, override inside that receiving page or that receiving page view model. And uh, you can see that what we pass is navigation parameter. The navigation parameter here, we parse it into a string, and then we handle it from there, and we load the appointment if it parses properly. There's a lot more code here. I just wanted to simplify to show how we can pass information directly into the view. It's model. also dealing with the cases in which something went awry. That's right. Sometimes demos don't show edge cases. Here's one. Yeah. We use try parse instead of just a quick cast because, frankly, a quick, quick cast isn't guaranteed. It is the way we write it, but in other people's Indeed. code. Indeed. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me show you a quick Prism implementation. I'll start with a blank app here. And let's just start by creating a universal app and then referencing the correct um, the NuGet package that we're going to use. So we'll start by first just creating the app. We'll do it both with um, or only Windows. And uh, it'll be the exact same implementation for phone as well. And we could have brought it all together, but there's really no need for it. All right, well, in order to find it, just search for prism.storeapps in the uh, NuGet search. I think it's worth calling out right now how much we don't love the search inside the NuGet dialog, but you know it works, I suppose. These are the, diff the five different uh, references that are added for you, and uh, each kind of builds on their own, and they're all very specific. And remember, it's different binaries for Windows, yeah. different binaries for phone. That's why they're Look how uh, much separate. code there is in that boiler boilerplate app.cs. It's exhausting. Talk about opportunity to get things wrong. Here's what you want to do. So this Highlight. is how Jerry and normally codes. Delete. There right. you go. Build check-in. <laughs> there's something now not working. It. Yeah, there's something not working. <laughs> Darren, will you check it out for me? <laughs> All right, look, we'll just change the application. It's no longer uh, inheriting from uh, application. It's, it's now inheriting from MVVM base. And so this really is the beginning of the end. I mean, there's only uh, a few more things to do until everything's done, but they're all quite trivial. Uh, the, what we'll do first is, and again, we were talking about this earlier, a common thing for developers to get wrong. Let me add my XML namespace here of, we'll call it Prism. And uh, this is where that MVVM base is located. And we'll change it so that the XAML no longer is um, based on page, but now it's based on... Uh, based on application, yeah, thank you. It's now MVVM app base, and I think that's uh, fix number one. Uh, there are a couple other things we're going to need to do, and uh, after we have fixed MVVM, after we've fixed the inheritance, after we've updated the XAML, we need to go in and do. Um, well, there are a couple things we want to do. There's only one we need to do, and that's the on launch. But let's start with um, the initialize component inside the constructor. There's nothing else you really have to do here. Um, if there was an extended start screen, you would do it in the initializer. Um, and then we have on launch. Remember we talked about on launch is the only abstract um, method inside that base. So this is the one that's really required, and it only happens at initial launch. It doesn't happen if you um, are activating or anything like that. So but once this again, this is uh, Jerry's typical implementation. <laughs> yeah, and so, and we're done. <laughs> and ship it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you dork. <laughs> All right, so it's, it's, this is a task, is why we have to do this funky little, little syntax right here. All right, so that's the beginning. I mean, if, if you're really trying to super simplify it, we're done. But next, let's talk about the experience and let's talk about navigation with the experience. So again, we like to use an enum because we don't like literal strings all over our application. So in this case, there's only one place to go main, but it could be comma login, comma details, comma however many experiences you create. Then we'll use the navigation service that's exposed to us by the base. So I can say this.navigation service and then navigate to experiences.main. So now I can't type it wrong, and I can get a build error if I ever change it, or I can get refactoring if I need to. I'm not going to pass anything to main page, so I'll just leave that as null. So this is the initial navigation. Again, because I'm navigating to an experience and not to a type, it also means I haven't even implemented anything yet, and I don't get any errors yet. And so let me go ahead and pull things apart here. 
I like to delete comments. With a passion. With a passion. All right, so let's, uh, I'm, usually these would go in separate um, folders and then separate files as well. But let me just put everything together here so we can kind of do it. So uh, pretend I'm in the controls folder or the controls namespace. So I'm going to create our abstract base page or page base, right? So it goes ahead and, and inherits from page just like we want to anyway. It just does this extra of the prism.mvvm.iView. Remember, that's one of the first requirements is that all of our pages or rather all of our views uh, implement iView, which has a zero implementation footprint, right? doesn't have anything you need to do. All right, so now that's our base class, done. So all of our pages can be built off of that. Now let's take our views. So this is our main page. I'm going to move it up into the views folder, so to speak. Now it's views.main page. And I could say controls.pagebase is what it inherits. So all I did was change it so it's no longer page. Now remember, just like before, um, you can't make a change in the code behind unless you also make a change in uh, XAML. So we know that um, page base is in controls. So here I'll make a reference inside XAML up to controls and then change it so that instead of uh, being uh, page, it's now page base. It's just something you have to do if you're going to change the, uh, the base class of, or the inherited base class of um, the code behind page of any XAML. Right? And so that will make it from this point forward. I have, all, I have my view and any others that follow the same pattern. We'll implement iView, and so I don't have to think about that requirement anymore. Everything is done, and I can also extend it anytime that I want. Now, let's keep thinking here. I don't just have a view in MVVM. I also have, uh, hang on just a second. Oh, you forgot you moved your class into main view, You're or into the views folder. <laughs> you have a sharp, sharp eye. That's exactly <laughs> right. So it, 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 the, part of the XAML declaration is saying where the class can be found, so obviously, I need to update that as well. Yep, good job. Would ReSharper have fixed that? Uh, yeah. Would it really? Mm -hmm. Well, that would have been nice. Yeah. Fine tool, that ReSharper. You've definitely started to sell me on it, no doubt about it. All right. So uh, now our next folder, instead of views, uh, we're going to need a, a view model. And uh, so instead of building the view model outright, let's start with what that view model will look like. So we'll create a public interface of I main page view model. So this is the way we want the view model to look. Again, very simple. We're just going to have title, nothing else. And uh, you don't have to set in any of the... Uh, what? It's inherently public if you create an interface. It's inherently public if you put it inside an interface. That's exactly right. And so that is iPage view model. This will be good when we create both the runtime and the design time view model. So now the next folder is view models. Again, this is all uh, just a convention. Where do you put your view models? You put them in the view models namespace. Where do you put your interfaces? You put them in the interfaces namespace. Can you put them anywhere else? Of course you can. This is just a starting place for yeah. how you can in organize. In fact, Solarizer is implemented as a single source file. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so these are the two things that a view model needs. Look, the first thing is the inheritance of view model. The second thing is the implementation of whatever its interface is. So in this case, the interface uh, causes us to create a single property of uh, title. And you can see that I'm able to use set property in the uh, setter of this uh, property. See, there's set property method. And the reason that works is because I, uh, it has bindable base because I'm inheriting from view model. Yep. The other thing I have, look, I can override on navigated too. And on navigated too, I don't need the navigation parameters. I'm just going to use this as my time to initialize the initial the 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 base data. I don't know yeah. the right word to use there, but yeah, initialize the data inside this class. And so what's great is that initialization might need to read from a file which is an asynchronous operation, the sort of thing you can't do inside a constructor. Okay, so now I want to associate um, the, the view model I just created to um, my view. Now remember, I don't want to tell the view the type name of, the, of my view model. I just want it to be connected. So I'll use the view model locator, auto wire up true, and it's done. Because I've done it, followed all the conventions and I put things where they need to go, it'll automatically, whenever it loads the page, go find the associated view model and set it as its uh, data context. Make sense? Yep. Uh, I'm going to update the UI now just so we can start using the data. And what would be interesting here is I can say, look, binding space. And we talked about this earlier. Where's title? Why don't I have title as an option? I have this, I don't have strongly typed 
IntelliSense because it has no idea, absolutely no idea, especially at design time, what my view model is. We're going to solve that by um, we're going to solve that by creating a design time view model. So let's start with a namespace. So just like before, we put all of our view models in view model. Well, I'm going to put the design time view models in design time. Again, you could put them wherever you want. This is just a starting place. So we'll call the same thing main page view model, but instead of inheriting from view model, all I really need to do is implement its interface. So remember, it's interfaces.ipage, iMain page view model, and all that it has is a single property. Uh, wait, there we go. Single property of title, and we're done. Okay, that's the full implementation. This will actually communicate to the designer for us all of the uh, the signature that we need. And so uh, here, instead of I don't have an override of on navigated to, I can only use the constructor, which is great because the constructor is executed at design time, which means this hello design time will work fine right here inside Blend or Visual Studio. So I, it gives me an opportunity to see what my data is going to look like. Now I'm not going to be able to reference my uh, designer, my design time view model until I first add the namespace to it. But uh, we'll put it right here. So it's D colon. Remember that D colon basically means this is only for the design time. When it's runtime, strip it away, you know, forever. And so here's my XML namespace called design time. It's just going to be basically our using statement up to the design time namespace we created. And uh, there's only one thing in it, but uh, it's the uh, main page view model, the exact same name as the view model we would have otherwise. You are kind of into naming them differently because it can <laughs> get confusing when you go around. Yeah. You might have a good point there. Um, again, design time view models must have an imp not an empty constructor, a default, a parameterless constructor, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'll run this in the simulator so we can see what it looks like. And I, I've got the binding wrong. Remember, I was f monkeying around with the binding. I don't know where this monkey thing is coming from. I know, but now it's stuck in your head. I know. <laughs> so anyway, here I've got the binding, and now I want to say title, and I have autocomplete just off the screen, so you can't see it. <laughs> ah, just missed it. But it does give me the intelligence that I would have expected, thanks to the design time view model. Now you can see it says hello runtime. But even cooler, let me stop it and show you the designer as well. So I'm, I'm going to split it because I had already made it so it's just the XAML. And now when I scroll up a little, you'll be able to see I have design time data just like I have runtime data. And I've implemented basically the most simplistic implementation, extending it from here. Now at least I'm following a bunch of conventions that makes it easy for me to know what comes next. Yep, great job. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Here's a developer tip for you. <laughs> ding, ding. We talked about this just a little, but uh, of course, this.navigationService.navigate takes a string, but we don't like literal strings, so we created an enumerable. You know, I, I, almost want, I almost always want to say enumeration or enumerable and mm -hmm. not get those quite right. And um, anyway, an enumerable that uh, is... It's an enumeration, actually. Is it enumeration? Yeah. <laughs> See? Oh, I enumerable. That's why, yeah, yeah. it's enumeration. Thank you. That's why I said it. The, it's an enumeration of what the experiences are. And uh, in Solarizer, you'll see we've given it a pretty high scope, moved it way out. It's not you know, inside App XAML where I put it here, which is sort of silly. But uh, nonetheless, that allows you to have everything strongly typed. You can make changes and uh, not worry that uh, there's some literal string out there you, you can't find yeah, it. Yeah, misspelt built. main. Yeah, misspelt main, which I can do. No. Totally. No. All right, let's take a look at uh, the module that we just went through. First, we talked just briefly about MVVM. We didn't teach you what it was or anything like that. Just talked about almost like an accepted thing, right? There are many, many examples of types of apps that should not use MVVM, but most really should, right? It mm -hmm. just keeps your application clean, keeps your code clean, separates things out, makes it so the next developer can come along and figure it out. What figure out what you're trying to do? We did acknowledge there are a few performance considerations around binding. Of course, MVVM very heavy on binding. So if you have a, the type of app that really needs to pay attention to massive data or serious performance, then maybe you need to have a hybrid solution of a little bit of MVVM and a little bit of direct writes, have yep. a on-click directly on your button, nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Then we talked about the basic implementation of Patterns and Practices Prism Framework, that it is not Prism for WPF. This is Prism for... Uh, store apps, yep. and the reason it's great for us is because it's a super lightweight MVVM uh, framework, 
plus a whole bunch of things that gives us some real candy in the store development and saves us a lot of effort. For example, it takes away all of that mess that's in the application uh, app XAML. That's uh, just easy to get wrong. Mm -hmm. And finally, we looked at the navigation service. That is really the first benefit that uh, Prism gives us, the navigation service that ensures that there's an on-navigated to and an on-navigated from in both your view and your view model, which is really great, and it solves the problem of how do you pass a navigation parameter to the next page when you want everything to be inside a view model. Problem solved. There's a little bit more we're going to talk about in the next module. We're going to talk about dependency injection as well as state management as well. All this is rolled up and handled just as simply as those are for us um, thanks to the PRISM framework that we have. Right? It's really great. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Anything you want to toss in there? Nope. All right. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Scotty and I are going to get something to drink. And we'll see you in 10 minutes with PRISM Part 2. Sounds good. Thank <music> you.